Welcome to Crash Landing. My name's Steve, and every episode I'm going to be guiding an intrepid explorer as they crash land on an alien planet. They have one hour to choose the five books they couldn't live without on their brave new world. Warning, ship crash landing. You have 60 minutes to enter the archives and recover significant cultural artifacts. Authorization required. Identify yourself. Hello, my name's Gemma Todd, but I write under GX Todd, and I'm the author of the Voices series. So far, um, it's a four-book series, and Defender was out last year, and Hunted is out the end of May 31st. It's a post-apocalyptic um, series, kind of think of Stephen King's The Stand versus The Walking Dead. A lot of people bring up The Walking Dead, but I've never watched it, so I'll just have to take their word for it. But there's no zombies. It's about internal voices that come to the fore and kill people off, essentially. So, yeah, it's fun. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, thanks for joining us. I can understand why people say The Walking Dead, just because it's the most popular post-apocalyptic thing out there at the moment. Yeah. I I keep meaning to watch it, but I've just never got around to it. Well, you could watch part of season one, and then it's pretty much the same every season, I would say. Isn't it just about to finish? No, no, it's still going. Christ. It's got a spin-off as well, Fear the Walking Dead. So there are two shows uh, in the same universe. So Yeah, life's too short for me to start on that bandwagon, I think. Well, it's only on about season eight. You got loads. T- <laughs> oh, no. Season eight. <laughs> I'm not kidding, yeah. Oh, oh my God, okay. <laughs> anyway, we're here to talk about books. Mm-hmm. So tell me what your first choice is. My first choice is, is one of my favourite authors, and it was difficult to pick one. Um, it's Richard Matheson and I Am Legend. Okay. I'm sure you've probably, most people I speak to have read this book. And I'm sure you've probably read it, I'm guessing you have. Yes, I have, I love it. Yeah, it's, um, it's a classic, isn't it? I mean, you, you can't go wrong with it, really. Um, I came to it when I was about 15 years old, and I was like in that romantic read everything ever written period and I'd written I'd read some post-apocalyptic fiction already I think I think I'd just come off the back of reading the day of the Triffids by John Wyndham yeah and I picked this book up and I think the thing that was most refreshing about it is how he it he it comes from a completely scientific point of view about vampires and for someone who had, had, had read stuff that it's all kind of like they were mythic creatures and it was all kind of made up and to read something that was so based on, on science as for a 15 year old it made me feel like vampires could actually happen mm-hmm. and it's not that it scared me but it just it it just it just felt like truth do you know what i mean yeah. but this was like pure science fiction as opposed to like fantasy or whatever and i was blown away by that really and by the time i'd finished reading the book when i, I read that last sentence which I won't give it away because it is a spoiler. I remember just sitting there with just awestruck, really, and thinking, God, that, that is how you finish a book. And I took that on board as an author, as a writer as well, that, you know, it's important to end anything really on a on a strong, emotive note like that. It was... Yeah, there's not many books that really kind of, like, make you sit back and think, wow, I was in the hands of a master there, and I really felt like I was in the hands of a master. <laughs> It's it's a deceptive book in some ways because you think it's one thing and it turns out to be something else. Yeah. You, you have the scientific approach to I'm sure now under modern scientific scrutiny it would know it wouldn't hold up compared to back when it was written, but at the time it worked really well. And and it's not a big book, that's the other thing. It's quite a lean no, book by modern it's standards. Like, yeah, it is. But it's still so good, there's just so much in there. Well, I remember it. I mean, it's, it was written in 1954 or something, in, in the 50s anyway. Yeah. So it was a good, like, 30 years before I was born. And I, I remember reading it and having no idea when it was written, just thinking, oh, this had been released last year. Mm. But it, it's so timeless. And when I looked on the publication page and saw it was 1954, I was, like, aghast again. I was like, oh, my, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe that's, like, whatever. It would have been 40, 50 years old. Mm. It's crazy. It was one of my reading gaps of certain classics that I just missed. And so I only mm-hmm. read this book about 15 years ago or something. Oh, yeah. So when I was sort of mid, mid late 20s, I read it. And at the time, I was just absolutely blown away. And then mm-hmm. after that, I then went and watched two of the film adaptations. I've now watched three because they made a third one. <laughs> they did. Uh, they shouldn't have done, but they did. 
yeah it it's not bad but none of them get it quite right i think none of that i don't understand why because the source material is pretty much perfect as it is i'm not sure why they feel the need to mess with it so much mm. i even got the um graphic novel adaptation that they did a while ago and that was quite good because that's a big oh. meaty thing Oh, I didn't know they did a graphic novel. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I'm trying to remember who's who's. It's quite well known artist who's done it, but it's it's very very close to the book, and mm, uh, it's all black and white art, and it's really really good. So oh, that's cool. I'm back into my gra- graphic novel reading at the moment, so I'd have to look that up. Yeah, it's probably the best adaptation I've seen because, I mean, the the original the Vincent Price one is now so old that you can watch it for free on YouTube. <laughs> oh my god. The rights have um, run out on it. Yeah, that the film is now public. You know, it's, it's just because it was that long ago. Um, That's insane. And then there was The Omega Man with Charlton Heston, and then finally um, I Am Legend with uh, Will Smith. Yeah. I've only watched that last one. I haven't watched the, the other two. The Omega Man is all right. It's not. Mm. It, it, it's probably. A, there again, they set it in a city, though. They do it very much in a city rather than a guy just in a town, which is like the book. So. Yeah. They've sort of urbanised it a bit, which doesn't really work for me. But you know, it was okay. It was okay. Cool. So that's my first pick. Okay. So tell me about your um, second choice. So my second choice is um, "Touch" by Claire North. Now I know Claire North is a pseudonym, and her real name's Catherine Webb, but she's also written under Cat. Is it Kate Griffin? Yeah. Yeah. So she's a prolific author for someone who's younger than I am. It's quite depressing thinking of how many books she's written. A lot. A lot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but her Claire North books are um, they're kind of almost they're, they're definitely marketed as mainstream, aren't they? But they've definitely they've got this kind of always a really unique premise hook behind them. So her first book that she released under that name was um, the first Fifteen Lives of Harry August, mm-hmm. which did did really really well. It was like um, it might have been like a Radio Two book pick and. You might have even got on the Richard and Judy, I can't remember. But Touch was the second one she released. And as much as I love the Harry August one, I found Touch to be... I just loved it more. I think it's the, it has such a science fiction element to it. Yeah. And, it, and it's rare that um, books with a science fiction element, such a strong one, manage, manage to get so successful. To be honest, because it doesn't happen very often. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's about this... Um, the main character is called Kepler. And then the hook of the book is Kepler is almost like an entity that can um, jump from person to person just through the, the touch of skin on skin. Um, and they're referred to as ghosts, but you never actually find out because Kepler isn't the only entity that can do this. There's a couple of three others or so that come into the book. Um, and you never actually find out what exactly they are, which I, I love that, that, that kind of question, of, are they ghosts, are they spirits, are they souls, are they some sort of alien well, they're not an alien thing because you, you know that Kepler was um, killed. It was essentially it was a it was a very violent um, attack. Right. And when she touched her her his murderer, she jumped. He see I say he she because never really. <laughs> it's Kepler very gender, Another reason why I love the books it's so gender fluid because Kepler has has been jumping so much into different bodies and spending time for like years, decades, even in other people's bodies mm. that she becomes whatever gender that he or she's in yeah so it's all it's like just so gender fluid it's wonderful um and it it could it could have been really confusing i mean the fact that this put this entity this ghost can jump from person to person and i mean there's a chase scene right at the start of the book where essentially she does just jump from person to, and it could be so confusing for a reader but in the hands of claire north i mean she's such a good writer anyway she pulls it off and she makes it look easy um, and it's a kind of book where I wish I'd come up with that, that idea it's such a good good idea and then to put it off on top of it, of having a brilliant idea is just a bit special and have you read Touch? I can't remember if you no, have no so I've read The First 15 Lies of Harry August mm-hmm. um, but I've not read this and she's got a new one that's coming out this year that sounds really interesting called 84K mm-hmm. that I think yeah. has already been optioned for like a, a film yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I've heard news that it's been optioned. So that was that was amazing. That's even yeah. before the books come out, it's it's done that. It has. I mean, all a book. I mean, Twitch would be really hard to film, but if I could get it right, that it's such like a thriller, thriller, urgent type pace narrative. Mm. It would work. It would translate really well as a movie. 
Yeah. But it's just she picks difficult things, doesn't she? I mean, Harry August is difficult. The time, the time loop that goes on in that book is quite confusing as well. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, Twitch is amazing. I'd love to like have that on my island or wherever I'm stranded and just read it again, just for the pure skill that goes that's involved in it. She does these very sort of high concept ideas for her Claire mm-hmm. North um, sort of persona. And they all got, I think it's one of these things that you could pitch each one in a couple of sentences and go, oh, that's really good. But she's one of these people who can then execute it well because it's all yeah. very well having a good idea. But it's can you carry it through? And she does. Exactly, exactly right. So many people have good hooks and I get really excited. And then when I sit down with a book, and it, it, it's actually quite rare that I can, that I can pull it off. Yeah. So the standards that are in my head because my standards are just ridiculous. Mm. I can't make my own standards, never mind anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right, the uh, the first 15 lives of Harry August was a Rich and Judy and a Red ah. book club and a Waterstones yeah, uh, did, book club did as well. Yeah, it did really, so. really well. You know, it literally hit every single thing it could hit for it to be a success. And it deserved to be. It was a really, it was a really fantastic book. Mm. But if I had to pick Touch, out of all the Claire North books that I've read, and I think I've read three or four now, Touch is always the one that I tend to recommend. Yeah. As a first book into reading her. Okay. Uh, 84K has been optioned for a television series. There you go. Mm-hmm. So that'll be hitting television, I don't know, in the next couple of years. So she's has great ideas, great execution, and then obviously people are thinking they could adapt them to other medium. And mm-hmm. uh, I hope I just hope it means people will go back and also read these books too, because that's always my fear, that they don't. They just watch the TV series or the film. I think, yeah. I think it always has a, a positive impact on on. What do they call them? Backlist. Am I, yeah. Have I made that up? Is it backlist? Yeah, anyway. no, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Backlist, um, yeah. Yeah, I think it does always have a knock-on effect. But she deserves it, you know. She's a, she's a lovely person as well, so... Mm. Okay, mm. tell me about your next choice. It's kind of in sync with the one I've just mentioned, about saying it's very rare for science fiction-type books to hit mainstream, like big mainstream success. And my third choice is The Time Traveller's Wife by Audrey Niffenegger. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's clever how they marketed it, really, because, well, it's clever how she wrote it, because the element of it, of the time-travelling strand through it, is wrapped up in this, this relationship between the two main characters. And it was very much marketed as that, as, like, a, how it was all the relationship with the unique element of the, the man in the main relationship being unable to stay in one time. He, he, he hops back and forth through time. Right. Um, and I'm not going to go into the synopsis because if you, if you haven't either read the book or come across the movie or at least read blurbs about either of those, then I don't know where you've been living for the past <laughs> ten years. To be honest. <laughs> and also, it's quite complicated. With but again, it's that thing where it's, it, anybody who tackles time travel and that kind of stuff, I'm always that have my respect because it's such a difficult thing to to do it well and for it to not be confusing and to not get absolutely muddled in the different time frames and stuff. And it's been a long, long time since I read this book. It's got, I must have read it when it was at the height of its popularity, to be honest. Yeah. So I can't remember when it was out, but it's a good 10 years, I'd say. Um, and I would like to just go back and reread it to, to see how does it hold up to my my very high standard of like when I read it I thought oh my god that was such a clever book and she did it so well or would I read it and think mm, now that I'm more in the like writing type world would I be a bit more critical of it I don't know but I remember being blown away by that as well the way because oh, just even, oh, the two main characters Claire and Henry when Henry first meets his wife who he knows he's going to marry she's six years old right so from, from the age of six she knows that she's going to meet this man as he hops through time fall in love with him and it's all about like fate and destiny. Like if, from it, can you imagine like knowing from six years old the, the person you were going to meet and marry one day when she would just finally meet him? I think he's about twenty six, working in a library. Yeah, he's never met her before. He hadn't at that point in his life he hadn't jumped in time to meet her. So like she comes up to him knowing straight away that that this is her life partner, and he's like, oh hello, who are you? And I just I don't know. I just it's mind boggling, but she just does it so well. It's um, it's a clever book. It's a clever book, and it's, um, from what I've heard, I think she's doing a sequel to it. 
Really? Which is, yeah, a long time in the making. Right, I'm not surprised if it's that complex yeah. a book and tricky to write. <laughs> well, she's um, she, she's definitely one of those novelists who's slow to, to write books. She, I think she's released two, maybe two others since Time Traveller's Wife. I remember the one because it has an awesome title. It's called, um, oh, do you know I said that? I'm not going to remember it. Her Perfect Symmetry, I think it's called. Right. And that came out a few years, but she's quite slow to writing stuff. So... Yeah, I don't know. What, this was slated as a the sequel was slated like to be released last year, and it's been pushed back and pushed back. So she might be struggling with it. Yeah, I remember when this book came out though. There was a lot of kind of stuff in the press saying, "Oh, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful literary novel and all the rest of it." And everyone, and then other people saying, "Well, it's clearly science fiction." They go, "No, no, it's not." I'm like, "Well, look at yeah. the title. Look at the yeah. title." But that's what they always do, I don't know. They're yeah. never going to push a. a a book like that with the science fiction bent front and centre, they never do. Mm. It always has to be something else. Which is so bizarre. It's a kind of book that could win the Clark Award. Yes. Quite easily, easily. because it's, yeah. it's got time travel and science fiction in, and yet you know that it was it was not marketed that way at all. No. I mean, if you look at the front cover, it looks like um, a literary book. Mm-hmm. Straight literary. It's her fearful, her fearful, I can't even say it. Her Fearful Symmetry is the second book she released. Right, okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm all for anything with science fiction getting a big success, but it would be nice if it was just classed as science fiction. It was nominated for the Arthur C. Clarke Award. There you go. Right, there you go. Okay. Um, I, think, I think we said this last time, there's a few other books you get that originally don't want to be claimed as science fiction, but eventually they do, like The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret mm-hmm. Atwood. That did then uh, it won the Clark Award, I think, it when did, it came yeah. out, and it won some other science fiction genre awards. And she said for years, she said it wasn't science fiction. And now we have the TV series, and I think she's mellowed a little in her older <laughs> age and has said, <laughs> well, well, it could be science fiction. I think she's now acknowledged it might be, but it took her a long time to get to that place, though. It's true. It's true. <laughs> oh, I, just, I was talking to a friend about this the other day. I just don't understand because. As I read like all genres, you know, I'm not stuck in one. I read whatever's going really. And honest to God, the highest quality of writing that I come across is in SFF, without question. You know, it's the highest quality of writing, and yet it never, it's just not cast on the same level as it trees in. It's just, it's not fair. So, <laughs> it's just a bit of a biased thing. I thought we were past that with some of the huge mm. mainstream things that are popular in tv and film that are all based upon science fiction and fantasy ideas you know mm-hmm. the biggest films of the year biggest tv yeah. series whether it's you know westworld or game of thrones or going back to lord of the rings films all of that sort of stuff you'd think we'd be past that but it mm-hmm. still pervades a lot of corners of uh, readers i think yeah and it makes me wonder whether it's a reader thing or whether it's like a bookshop bookseller um supermarket thing where they're just not quite brave enough to put those books front and centre. I don't know. It's it's a conundrum really, isn't it? Mm, Maybe if you had more people putting stuff in windows that was straight uh, science fiction fantasy then I don't know, we'd have more exposure and it would change a little bit. You don't know these things, do you? No, but if you go into a supermarket and you pick up a book, it's rare that on the shelves there you'd find uh, a fantasy book. I think the few ones you'd find there now are things like Game of Thrones. Because it hit big, yeah, you know, on TV screens and stuff, yeah. Mm. So it, it, it takes success for them to take a, a, a punt on it, it seems like to me. I think so, I think so. Anyway. Yes. Tell me about mm. your next choice. Yeah, the next choice is S by Doug Dorst and J.J. Abrams. But it's also known as The, the Ship of Theseus. Okay. This is the book, which is like the book within a book within a book. If anyone's seen it, it's, um, it's a very clever marketing um i'm just getting it off my bookshelf actually so i have not look at it it looks like your classic um cotton bound hardback library book it's even got um a, a jury number on the spine as if it's been on on the library shelf right. if you open it up it's got um the library stamp in the whole i mean aesthetically it looks like a library book it's amazing the the quality of it yeah and it's written by a, a fake author called V.M. Straker, or Straker, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And there's a big mystery behind this chap because it's a pseudonym. And the guy who's written the introduction to this book 
and the footnotes to it is was a close friend to this 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 author who yep. no one has the identity to this um this bloke's never met him and yet he's followed all his work he's always translated the editions for him so you've got the story the ship of theseus is almost like um metafiction so it's fiction written by this this pseudo this pseudonymous is that a word pseudonym for making you <laughs> It's pseudonym author, yeah. Um, but it's based on his real life, and people are in it because they're trying to get clues to try and work out who this, this striker is. So there's your, your first story, the actual book itself. But within that story, you have annotated notes written through it. So um, I think it's like a postgrad student is is studying striker as part of his dissertation or something, and he's written pencil notes and like. Um, pen notes for all the clues that he's trying to work out who this, this striker is. So when he's written it, returning it to the library, this other girl who's um, a junior, a senior in college, she's picking it up to read his notes. And then she starts writing annotated notes in different coloured ink. <laughs> so it, I t- I seriously, it's such a clever, clever um, thing to have done. And I can't even imagine how much planning and that went into making this book. Because not only that, you have inserts. So as these two um, postgrad and senior college student are going back and forth talking and developing a relationship while working on this book, you've got letters that fall out the pages and postcards. You know, if one of them goes travelling to try and find some clues, and it's just such an inter. This isn't something you could get out of Kindle. No. You have to buy this book and live with this book because it's so immersive that you really it kind of takes over everything to be honest, and you. I'd say you have to set a good three weeks aside to be able to first read the book in itself, yeah. then go back and read the annotated footnotes. Because it's... Oh, seriously, Steve. So do you find out more about this guy through their notes? Like, who he is and who yeah. he might be? Yeah, but like, you know, J.J. Abrams is a great it lost. He doesn't necessarily yeah. give you answers to everything. Right. Uh, it's still There's still very much a mystery involved. But if you go and like read some people's reviews, they're convinced there's like code in the footnotes. So it's like almost becoming this mythical type um, treasure hunt where you've got readers going away and trying to work out who this fake, it's a fake author. Right, so they think it's someone actually real. Well, I don't think they think it's real, but they're just trying to work out the mystery. They've got that like engrossed in the whole narrative of it that they're just like, oh, we need to work out who this guy is. Yeah. It's very clever, but it's, oh, you have to pay attention and you have to sit down and really read it. And But, you know, if I was trapped somewhere... That's three books in one, so I thought that was a good pick. It's it's one of these things, as you said, you couldn't have a digital version. You couldn't no. have an a an audio book. It has to be seen, and it's it's a proper artifact. It's something yeah. you fold out and explore and look at and study, mm-hmm. almost like a like a piece of literature text that you would study at school. Yeah, and you just feel like that. Like it feels like J J Abrams and Doug Dawes to approach this with a real love. Of books, you know, like real tome books that you can pick up and hold and smell, and yeah. it's like a love letter to that, which is another thing why I appreciate it so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm still proper old school. I don't have an e-reader, and I don't really like <laughs> them as a rule. I'd rather just, you know, you know, go to an old second-hand bookshop and pick up a two-pound version of paperback of an old dog-eared thing and read that. Mm-hmm. Then go out and you know have an ebook, and rather just have the battered old thing on my shelf somewhere. Um, I, I don't I don't like. I mean, I spend enough time looking at screens anyway, so I don't look at another screen where I'm trying to relax and read a book. You'd love this then. Yeah, yeah, it's a proper artifact. It sounds like the ideal thing for me. There, there are certain books I I want to own. I want to have on my shelf. Yeah. And um, I got. I think I told you. I can't remember. But I got a special edition of Dune by Frank Herbert. Yes. The folio edition. Yes, so it's a special slip-cased hardback edition with new paintings that were done, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And it's <laughs> one of my favourite books ever. So I was like, when I saw this special edition, I thought, "Yep, I'll get that." <laughs> They're like works of art, though, aren't they? they that, are. That's what they are. They are works of art. Yeah, yeah. And you need to appreciate them for that. I would often just show you my copy, but I've still got it in its cellophane. So I'm convinced in another ten years, these are going to be an absolute fortune to buy. <laughs> But Tom's got a copy. You can always ask him. He's just been leafed through and, and paged through quite a lot. So. Okay, so you read his one and kept your own. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Tom had it for Christmas and I read it first. And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And then I bought a copy. So. 
Yeah. We should say it's our mutual friend Tom Bissell from uh, yeah. the Bookful podcast. Yeah. <laughs> okay. He's useful sometimes. Uh, what number are you on? What's your next one? What number is this? The last book I chose mm. is, of course, I, don't, I was always going to have to pick a Stephen King, and it was very hard to, to narrow it down, but I've gone with The Shining. Okay, so why The Shining out of all? I know you're a big Stephen King fan, so why The Shining? I am a big Stephen King fan, and yet I haven't read probably, I probably only read 60% of his bibliography. Yeah. So there's still a lot of books that I haven't I was quite like to the game coming to, and I didn't read The Shining until... It was only fairly recent. It was about four years ago, maybe. Mm. Three or four years ago, I read it. And I'd had so many people tell me how amazing it was. I kind of like picked up and think, yeah, I'll enjoy it, but it's not going to be, you know, it was written in 1977, 76, something like that. Yeah. But I I read it, and it's just such a good book. And it's always classed as this kind of horror. But I kind of like from it thinking that is probably the best psychologically deep and profound book that I've ever read it's about this, this the main character is like he's a recovering alcoholic and he's literally losing his mind and there are um, supernatural elements to it I mean Danny Torrance the kid in it has got the shining and he, he sees things and experiences things that are definitely supernatural mm-hmm. but as far as Jack Torrance is for me as a reader I just read it as this guy who was going absolutely mental right. and is it and there's a piece of writing that, that kind of explores that. I just found it so fascinating. And, you know, Stephen King, it, a lot of his stuff is based on his own personal life. And he had massive substance abuse problems, didn't he? Um, when he was younger, yeah. Yeah, and I can't remember when he kicked that habit or whether this was written before or after. Or, but oh, it's almost like a biography of his torment. And, you know, because he was a father and he had young kids. And I don't know. I read it very much as as that kind of a, of an experience that this guy who's trying to do the best for his family, he's going there to get work, to get paid, to look after them, and he just goes mental with the the solitude of it and trying to work. He can't work, and he should be able to work. Cause he's in the perfect place to be able to work and to turn on the ones that you love you love most in all the world your your son and your wife. I don't know, it was just chilling, but not necessarily for me for the horror elements of it, but just for like the, the monster that lives inside us all. Yeah, yeah. He did it so well. So it was an exploration of someone slowly going mad over the pages. Yeah. Have you, have you read the sequel, Doctor Sleep? I did read the sequel, and again, I think my expectations were so high from coming up. Because I just recently read The Shining, and I was just like, oh my god, that's the best King book I think I've ever read. Yeah. And I enjoyed Doctor Sleep. I did enjoy it, but it, I think I was expecting just a different story. I think, and that was my fault. I went into it expecting a different story, and what I got wasn't necessarily what I wanted at, at that precise moment in time. Hmm. Um, have you read it? Not Doctor Sleep, no. And it's been a long time since I read The Shining, so I need to go back and read that. But I saw the film again not too long ago. Have you seen the, yeah. the Shining film? I've seen it. So many times I watched. I went to the cinema again to watch the extended special version of it as well. Because I, th- um, I think Stephen King didn't like it, from what I can he remember. Hated. Yeah, he, I'm pretty sure he hated it. Yeah, because <laughs> it's just been featured again in in Steven Spielberg's Ready Player One. There's, yes, there's a whole true. section where they go to The Shining, and of course it's the Kubrick version mm-hmm. of the film. And so I'm just thinking, oh no, it's never going away. I was delighted with that. In that, that was the, the high point of that film for me. Yeah, I was, was so excited version. when that happened. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was like, oh, it's like it's that whole reminiscent thing that everyone's tapping into. It just it really hit hit home for me that one. I was like, oh, <laughs> brilliant. But I like the film. I, I, the thing is, I take the film for what it is. I don't necessarily. It's not like a faithful representation of the book hmm. in every respect. But I think it's a damn good horror film. Damn good. It's rare that you get a film adaptation that's as good as a book mm. it's very rare I think and most of the time they do try and tell their own story rather than just do a direct scene for scene copy otherwise you get a bit of a mess because it doesn't really translate well I think that's the problem when you get a lot of um, big fans of books being upset with movie ad- adaptations that you know books are a very different medium to films and they're never they're never going to be able to capture what they have in a book you know they've got yeah. like a, a fifth of the time to do it in you spend eight, ten hours in a book on average 
um, if you're a slow reader like me. Whereas a film series, you know, I think people just need to go to these things with an open mind and not expect the world from them. Mm. I think my, um, my favourite Stephen King book is still The Green Mile. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I actually think the film is actually really good. I was surprised. It's a long film, but I'd rather mm-hmm. they did that than cut too much out. Even then, they've still cut some stuff out, but the film is a damn good adaptation, but uh, it's very rare. I've never read the book, and yet I love the film. I watched it again recently. Mm. Um, and I'm surprised because I love the film so much that I haven't gone on and read the book. But like I said, I've got so much... It's almost like I'm keeping them safe, these King books that I haven't read. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know... Steve, Stevie, Steve, he's getting old and he's not going to be around forever, is he? And I'm just like, oh, what am I going to do when he's no longer around to give us these amazing books? At least I'll have a few. I'll have a few left to be able to read. Yeah, you're holding some back. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I remember when I was picking up The Green Mile when it first came out originally and it was released in these novellas. Well, sort of 100 pages, 150 mm-hmm. pages and they did to sort of come out and then six months later you'd get another one or however many months it was, and they sort of released six of them, and which hasn't, hadn't been done that way, and there was no e-books and audiobooks back then, so you just had to sort of read, read that and then wait, and wait for the next one, wait for the next one. You can get collected versions now, but cool. that was really different. So I've now got the originals and all this in the separate bits and a collected version I got later. Wow. He was good with his gimmicks, like his publishing gimmicks, wasn't he? Yeah. I think he, he lived for, that, for that, that type of stuff. Yeah. You, can't, you don't really get a... I can't think of a recent one where they've done anything like that. Not really. Mm-hmm. They tend to do a digital version now. That would be the only equivalent. You wouldn't get a paper version. You'd get like mini digital releases and then a collected version on yeah, paper. John Scalzi did that for a science fiction book. It's still essentially what King did with those, though, isn't it? It's nothing new. No, and he did that based upon the old stuff like Dickens and other people did mm. back in the day when they did that. They sort of collected yeah. small editions and then collect- collected. Have you read any of his um, non kind of genre stuff? Um, I'm trying to think. Give me an example. Like Mr. I have read... Mr. Mercedes. Have you read that? I, yes, I read Mr. Mercedes, but I read I didn't read it the second or third, and that will probably tell you what I thought. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Okay. I didn't dislike it, but it wasn't what I wanted. You I wanted something. For a certain... Yeah, it just felt like he'd written it to for it to be made into a movie, which is fair enough. Hmm. But you know, I can get that kind of crime thriller element in in. A thousand books. Yeah, that's on the shelf. They've done um, a TV series of the first one. With, yes, true. Um, uh, Donald. Um, John, Brendan yeah, Gleeson. Gleeson. Brendan Gleeson, yeah, right. Yeah. Which I would really love to watch, but I don't think there's UK access to that yet, is there? Not yet, no. But I, I think it's gone well, so I think they're looking to adapt the other ones eventually. But mm. I, there's so much on at the moment in terms of TV. It's one that I'll get around to when we see yeah. it. But see, I'm, that's the. Thing. I would like to watch that, but as far as books go, I wasn't that. I wasn't too bothered with those. You prefer more the supernatural and his... Yeah, I mean, I love Drew Land, which technically isn't supernatural. It's in that, um, is it Hard Crime Cases series, yeah. I think? Yeah, Hard, yeah, something like that, yeah, yeah. Hard Case Crime, anyway, yeah. that series. And I love that. I think, do you know what, I do think Stephen King is, is at his best when he's doing, like, um, more concise fiction. So that's like that's only what maybe two hundred and ninety pages long. Yeah, and I'm saying it's coming off the back of saying I love the Shining, which is massive. <laughs> but it's, it's no stand. Come on. <laughs> no, it's, but it's still no stand or it. But yeah. um, I do. I think he's especially excellent at, at when he does the shorter fiction. I mean, I love his short stories, but Juryland was a joy. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really rated that, and that's that's pure like serial killer type fiction there's no supernatural there's hardly any supernatural stuff in that the kid in it is a bit supernatural but it that's not the focus of the story mm. so i enjoyed that and have you read his backman books i can't remember we talked about this yes because i i we spoke about desperation didn't we yes and that's right the regulators yeah i've read a few of them can't say i, I doubt i read them all i can't remember to be honest i was looking through his um, bibliography the other day because he's like written fifty plus novels or whatever it is. Wow! And it, I, I know what every single book is about, but I haven't. Re- it's weird, isn't it? He's one of these authors that people just know his work. They yeah. know. So like the Tommy Knockers, I've never read, never seen the film, and yet I know what it's about. Mm-hmm. Or Pet Cemetery, never seen the film, never read the book, and yet I know what it's about. It's just, he it just pervades. That's what I love about him actually. That people have just embraced him, haven't they? 
uh, yes, he's become part of popular culture now. His name is yeah. synonymous with the type of book. Yep. He's, and that's so rare for a genre writer. Yeah, there's very... I mean, there are other people that you can compare him to and, and sort of peers, but it's like Terry Pratchett. There was only one person who wrote that kind of book, and that was it. Yeah. There was no one else. No. No, they're special, aren't they? They're kind of writers. And the, he's just so prolific as well, Stephen King. Over the years, he's just kept going doing different things experimenting with from dark tower to straight crime to something but he's just just kept going and there's so many mm, i know that's and that's rare for an author to be able to, get, to be given that freedom to write in all different kinds of genres you don't get that very often either no and he just seemed to be doing it from the start really i mean he obviously starts with his horror but you know he did the um Shawshank and stuff was fair. Wasn't that fairly early? The Running Man was fairly early in his career. Yep, yeah, it was. Didn't he, yeah. That was a Batman book, wasn't he? Yes. Batman. Yeah. I said no Batman then a Batman book. <laughs> um, and that's pure science fiction. Yeah, he just. I think he writes what he wants to write, and just because he's so good at what he does, that people go, "Yeah, I'll buy that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for for some fans, they'll just buy the book sight unseen with his name on it, and that's it. Yeah, I'm one of those people, to be fair. <laughs> but after he's, he's been doing it for this long and he's he's obviously very, very popular, then you can understand why he's got such a following from some people. They just, yep, I'll, I'll pick it up. Yeah. It's just so good. It's nice to feel in safe hands. <laughs> it, that's, I guess that's it. That's it. You may not know what you're going to get, but you know you're in safe hands. Mm, exactly. I think, which is always good. Okay. Yep. So, unfortunately, you're now going to have to crash land on an alien planet but the good news is you get to choose what kind of a planet you want and it can even be one that's a specific named planet like you know middle earth or something so where are you going to be crash landing well i'm cheating a little bit with this because it's the it's the the vessel that i'm crash landing in that i want to be in <laughs> and it's the wayfarer from becky chambers wayfarer series mm-hmm um, so my first book was uh, A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet and the second one was A Close and Common Orbit, I think it's called and her new one is at the end of July and I'm not going to remember the name of it because okay. it's not quite hit my radar yet, it's a few months or right, but if you've not read the books if you think along the lines of um, Firefly and Farscape so that, that kind of cast of characters that all live on board a ship yeah. That is essentially what you get with the Wayfarer ship in a long way to a small angry planet. And I want to be part of that um, company, please. <laughs> I want to be the, the human that has actually got enough skills to help in a survival <laughs> situation. But they just take on board and adopt as their own because, I don't know, because I'm cool. <laughs> So it's the crew of people that you're more interested in than the actual yes. place. It's the, it's the kind of that inclusive, fun gang of, of reprobates mm-hmm. <laughs> that I would like to spend some time with. Because we could just live on the ship, you know, it's crashed, I'm sure. With, there'll be a, 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 what you call it, a token mechanic on there that'll fix fix stuff up. We could just live on the ship, it'll be fine. <laughs> there'll be some um, botany still made plants that we can eat. It'll mm-hmm. be all good. So I, I never leave the house anyway, so I might as well just have a nice spaceship with cool people to spend time with. As long as you've got a window, look outdoors a bit. Yeah, there'll be a, a window somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> but there is on the Wi-Fi, there's a lovely um, picturesque, I think it's where they eat their meals, like the galley type yeah. place. You can go and look at the stars. So there's definitely a window on it. <laughs> Sounds very kind of Firefly-esque. Yeah, well, apparently Becky Chambers hadn't read, hadn't watched, sorry, Fly, Firefly by the time she'd written any of it. The only um, kind of all ensemble cast spaceship thing she had watched was Farscape. And you can feel Farscape in it, definitely, but it's your own thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that's that's a different choice than we've had anything before, so. <laughs> well done for originality. I'll give you, I'll give you points for that. I'm bending yeah. the rules slightly. I keep bending the rules for people, but. Uh, I'll allow it because there aren't that many planets that are actually that nice you know I was thinking about ones and that you just I'll die within the first week I don't really want to die you could just live in the Shire and just (laughs) just sit around eating all day drinking Uh, going to going to someone's 770th birthday party that is true but I'm sure everybody picks the Shire everyone probably always goes to Tolkien no one's been yet 
Really? No, one's, you're off no one's picked Middle Earth yet, and no one said, "Can I just crash land in the Shire and then just sit around all day eating, <laughs> drinking, and writing my books?" I'm like, Hang on, nobody said this yet. No, everyone's oh, going to pick it, but they can't all do it. So. We're all scared. Someone else has already gone there. That's why. <laughs> No one's done it yet, but too late. You're going to crash land into another ship. Uh, I'm happy. I'm happy with that. Live on that on the way forward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you for coming on the crash landing, and thank you for telling no us problem. about your book choices. Thank you very much. My thanks to Gemma Todd for joining me this episode. The first book in her series, Defender, is out of now in paperback and hardback, and the second book in the series, Hunted, is published on the 31st of May. For more information about Gemma and all of her books, you can visit her website, which is gxtodd.com. And if you'd like to support this show and all the other shows on the Geek Syndicate network, then you can go to patreon.com forward slash geeksyndicate and become a patron of the podcast. <laughs>